so look, let's talk about writing. We're going to talk for about 40 minutes. There'll be a break after about 20 minutes to have some questions, and then we'll have some questions at the end. I always felt that writing is the most, it's the least valued of business skills. We've all done presentation skills. Everybody thinks that everyone else can write. It's not the case. Now, what we're seeing now in a lot of our clients and a lot of our businesses is a big move towards improving writing skills. So what we're going to do today is look, uh, it, it, we've called it five points, but it's actually going to be four points and then a tip at the end to bring it all together. So let me tell you what we're going to talk about. We, we're totally different uh, in our approach on this course in that we start with the readers. They're, if you like, they're the consumers of our written work. So my, my approach is put these people first. Before you write a single word, think about your readers. I'm going to show you two ways into this. The first one is about clarifying your objectives, and we split the objectives into thinking, feeling, and doing. And the second way into this is something called a reader response model. I'm going to give you the first stage is that. Then we look at flow. Flow is, you know what flow is? Flow is when it feels really great to be doing a task. That's when your abilities and the task are matched. You've got a stretch. It's just enough. I'm going to show you how to map your flow, but also give you some concrete suggestions on how you can improve your writing conditions. The last point on this slide is feedback. Feedback is a tricky one because it's so valuable to our writing, and all of us, without exception, have an emotional problem with feedback. I'll show you some ways through this and also give you some tips how to maximize the feedback you receive and the feedback you get. Point five, which is the invisible one, which I can add because I don't think Excel with Business can hear us, is something very, very cheeky and very funny, and it's about charity collectors and how good they are with language. And there's a lot we can learn from them. It's kind of like the secret point at the end of this. Let's begin. Let's, let's begin by really saying, why are you writing? Okay, why are you writing? So writing is a form of influence. What you want to do is to be able to change how someone is. When we split this change into thinking, feeling, and doing it. Now, to, to, to be an effective writer, you've got to have this clear in your mind, what you want to achieve through your communications before you start writing. So. To become a writer of influence, to become someone that changes a person, you need to have a real, real clarity. Now, many of us, especially when we do long reports, we don't really know where our writing is going. We think we almost use a report as a kind of form of research, and we'll think, oh, let's let me write all this stuff out, and I'll come to a conclusion. No, it's different in business. Have your conclusion sorted, get all your research done before you start writing the final document. Now, these three categories are very interesting. I'm going to give you um, an example. Something I saw about 12 hours ago at the airport. It's an advert that HSBC has, the bank, and it's always at airports. It's always actually exactly when you're waiting for a plane. It's in that, it's in that corridor where you're standing up and waiting, and it's an advert with different plug sizes. It's a very, very smart ad. There's very little text on it. It's a very strong image. And what it does is say that the bank, the HSBC, is a global bank which acts locally. So it's a very complex uh, idea that's getting across, and it's got a, um, half a second to get it across. Now, what this ad, ad, why is that so successful is because it changes everything. You think, what you feel, what you do with this bank. So the first thing is you see this bank, and it's got plugs from Hong Kong. Panama. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, we can't see your slides. We can't see uh, any of your slides. Okay. That's that's obviously a blow. Okay. Have I got screen privileges on this? Because it's saying that they're they're showing. So we can see your slides, but we're seeing them in a. Um, we're only we're seeing all all of them on one page and not you know one at a time. You're seeing them like kind of as a slice sorter. What about now? I've changed it. Is it is it good now? 
if you go into your main into your main slide that you're talking about, then it's yeah. What about now? Better? Uh, that's a lot. Yeah, that's fine. Then you go for okay. I think we're gonna, that's kind of going to be the best we're going to do today. Okay. Am I free? Can I, Adam? Adam can, can yeah, yeah. Go? It's all working fine now. Yeah. Okay, apart from, apart from the sound and the image, everything is good. Let me continue. I'll rescue this, everybody. I'll rescue this. Don't you worry. So back to HSBC. So it makes you think, right, this bank is everywhere, but it also changes what you feel about the bank because you, you suddenly think, actually, I trust this bank at both the global and the local level. Because remember where the advert is? It's where you're changing planes or going on or coming off a plane. And it's normally that you're in a different country and you feel no matter how many flights you've got, you always got a slight worry is, is my computer gonna, 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 gonna connect properly? And that's what the bank is playing on. It's saying, wherever you are, we look after you. And the do it. Okay, the bank doesn't expect you to go from the airport and open an account. But what it's hoping is sometime in the future, when you have uh, the choice to think about a new bank for yourself or for your business, HSBC, will stick in mind. Now let me give you a more detailed example and a more personal example with Paolo. Now Paolo is one of those guys, he's been with the firm four or five years, you've got no idea what he does, he's kind of one of those guys comes in late, stays overnight, does something with the computers and he's leaving. Your job is to drum up support for Paolo's leaving due. You send something out, last week, no one said yes. The event is tonight, you're panicking. How can you get these 240 people to respond? Now, remember, think, feel, do. Imagine you could send out three emails to different groups. You've got 240 people you want to get. How can you change what people think, feel, and do about Paolo's leaving do? Let's have a look. Think. We could stress in the email all the great things that Paolo has done for us over the years. We may not have spoken to him, we may not be mates, but maybe he's done something that's been really essential for us. And let's, let's say thank you by you know, like shaking his hand and saying goodbye. And also, we can stress some of, some of the benefits of turning up. And this is when you move it from Paolo to a group. You can say, also there is head of HR, people from L&D, maybe manufacturing, they're all there for a chat. Oh, that guy you want to work with on a project, he'll be there as well. So there are benefits bef you know, beyond Paolo. So now you're, people are thinking, hmm, I wonder if I can turn up. That sounds like a good idea now. Changing how people feel. You can say, you can play, here's a guilty one, really. Imagine you as your leader been here four years. No one turned up. How would you feel? Now, again, slightly manipulative. Well, actually, very manipulative. But someone's going to say, oh, God, you know, that's correct. I'm go I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want the bad karma of not turning up for Paolo. Yeah, I'm going to turn up. And also, you can do this as a positive. You can say, mm, it's been years since we've had an informal group, group do. Do you remember how great it was when we used to, that time we all went out, had a chance to talk and have a drink, and, you know, we were able to meet new people, resolve differences, have a laugh, stressing the feelings involved. Ultimately, you want to do, which is them to turn up, but you can actually get people to turn up earlier by just changing the email. So, you know, one thing, I was in this scenario, not as Paolo, I hasten to add, but someone who is, who is organizing Paolo's leaving do, and I just said, look, uh, the do's at six, if anyone wants to come, leave, skip work early at four and help me with setting up, I'll be in the restaurant. You know, it's a very powerful message. It's Friday, yeah, I want to, yeah, of course I want to leave work an hour and a half early. Of course I do. And what you could also say to move people there is you say, yeah, but if you come, we're feeling, you know, it's not going to be a massive night. Uh, this food, the first drink, alcoholic or non-alcoholic, is paid for by the firm, by the directors. You will see a huge uptake in people. Nothing, of course, to do with Paolo. You don't tell Paolo that they've come there just because there's free sandwiches. But you can use your writing to influence. Okay, So think about this. Think, feel, and do. Writing is a form of influence. And just bear in mind that there are many different ways to get the desired outcome 
from your writing. It's, not, it's very rarely that one size fits all. My second idea. This builds up to the reader response model. And it's a triangle. It's a very simple triangle, which we call useful, interesting, and enjoyable. I'm going to show you how this works with the guidebook. You've gone for a weekend to the beautiful city of Seville in Andalusia in Spain. And you open the guidebook because you want information. So where is the Tower of Gold? How do I get there from the cathedral? What time is the bus to out of town? A train is going to Madrid tomorrow. So this is pure information. Now, useful is what you need now. Most useful thing, buildings on fire, run. Okay? No one cares you got the spelling wrong on that message. Yeah? The usefulness is speed. It's like get it out there. It has value because it's needed now. Most good business writing has to be useful. The second corner of the triangle is interesting. So think about the guidebook. You're at the Tower of Gold. It's a really wealthy building. And you think, well, where did the money come? Yeah, to build the Tower of Gold. And you think, oh, I'm really interested. It came from the trips to what is now Latin America. It came from basically robbing, <laughs> robbing money. You know, it came back to Seville. People became very rich in Spain because of this colonialism. This is all interesting stuff. It's not, inf it's not useful now, but it will be something you want to store away. Now, you store this away mentally because it's good, good and interesting. But also we do this now with computers. Those of you who use uh, Evernote, for example, it's one of those classic, that's interesting, I've not got time, I'll come back to that later. When you come back to your Evernote articles, where if like me you're stuck at an airport uh, and you want to go through your stuff, you only look at maybe one in five, one in ten, but they're really interesting. You don't need them at that point of time, but they really stick with you. The third part of this, which is the hardest one, okay, is something that is enjoyable. Now, you've left Seville, you're heading off to Barcelona, uh, which is a lot, actually Madrid is more feasible, it's closer, and you read a chapter on the book on history of art and Andalusia. Now, it's not useful in, in any sense, it may, not be, it may be interesting, but it's, you're primarily reading that because you enjoy it, okay? there is fun to be got from writing. Now, there's very little fun, to be honest, in business writing. Enjoyable in this sense mean, means you've crafted the communication well. You know, no one's going to, your, your, your memo on expenses is not going to be full of jokes, but enjoyable means it's easy to read. People feel confident that you've expressed yourself well. It's concise, but all the information is there. Now, when you look at this triangle, even the best writers in the world will struggle to have more than one of these in play. You know, the very best writing of any kind maybe has all three of these in play, but for seconds. Maybe you can get two of them. To get read, you must have at least one of these, and it must be clearly visible to the reader. If your work isn't useful, or it isn't interesting, or it isn't enjoyable, no one is going to read it. And you can understand that from a reader perspective because you're all readers. Yeah? You know what it's like. Your heart sinks when certain people write to you. To you and it lifts when you pick up, uh, say, if there's um, a journalist that you like reading about and you know they express themselves well, you'll choose that. Okay? And that will be because it's, it, say, say like a, uh, an article on business, could be useful, could be enjoyable if someone's put enough work into it. You know, there are no quick fixes here. You have to put work into these. But these are the factors that will get you a readership, that get you people following you. Now, the second stage of this is to think of a, I'm going to move the example now into a kind of Sunday newspapers. Sunday newspapers are very clever. I don't buy them anymore because it's like everyone has got 20 parts and I get everything online. But it still works for online as well. There's a tremendous amount of content, Sunday papers. And what they do is design in a way that you can immediately throw out or ignore what you don't need. So, for example, I've got no interest in cars. So if there's a supplement on cars, I bin it. 
If there's cartoons, I'm going to save it for my daughter. If there's something on books, right, I love that. I'm not going to read it now. I'm going to keep it. It'll be interesting later. Okay. So it's cleverly designed like that. And Sunday papers, you hope they're going to be useful. I hope they're going to be interesting, but you're really reading them for enjoyment. Now think about this, my drain gets blocked on Sunday. I don't care about enjoying, I don't care about design, I don't care about the history of the drain clearance company, I want the name of the company and a phone number. I want maximum use, because I, I don't care how they're adverse designs. Okay, I want the number. You sometimes see this when companies write to you, they'll say, our values are really, really important. We care tremendously about customer care. We're sorry that uh, the train is late. Here's a here's a five pound voucher. You, as the consumer, you don't want, you don't need to go. You don't care about their values. You're just angry because the train is late. And the more that people in that situation, apology letters from business, the more they prevaricate, the more they put all that verbiage before the apology or the compensation, the less you like it. Because what do we want from our writing? We want to be, from our reading, quick is a really good thing. So think sometimes the drain clearance approach does work. Now, remembering these three words, useful, interesting, enjoyable, let's go into a reader response model. Now, the reader response model, the last three elements of this, useful, enjoyable, interesting. We've already covered that. Here's the top three. This model is, is subjective. It, this is your assessment. You can't know this for sure, but it's what you think before you start writing. So first question, what is the probability your reader or readership will read more than half of your writing? It goes from very low to very high. How hot are they? I have to explain this carefully. Hotness is an eagerness to read you, nothing else than that. So they're not eager, eager to read you, nothing. If it's your exam results, you're very hot for that email, for that letter. How much time do you think they have? Next to nothing or a lot? Okay. Now, this model isn't numerical. It's not scientific. It's subjective. It's your assessment. But I do this. I do this kind of schematically with this sort of spreadsheet for any lengthy piece of work. And I do it mentally for any email above two lines. You know, I think, well, how much time have they got? What can I, you know, is it useful? If I get something like this, where the scores are all trending towards the left, what's my point in writing? They're not going to read me. They're not interested. They've got no time. Maybe it's useful, but... It doesn't tell me don't write. What it says is make my communication really short, really brief. Be prepared not to be read. Now, a more favorable situation comes in our second example. Are they going to read more of the writing? You think, yeah, of course they are. They're really interested in what you've got to write. They've got lots of time. You know you're pressing their buttons. Useful, enjoyable, interesting. In this case, You've got a very, very strong signal that the reader is going to read your work. And if that reader is important to you, spend a lot more time on what you're writing. Really polish it. Really make sure it's good. Now, the third one is really, really interesting. This is this kind of a split decision. You've got no time, yeah, low probability. They don't like your writing. But they're hot, it's really useful for them, and they're interested in that. Now, sometimes, now this is a course, or this is a presentation on writing skills. But actually, what you've got here is you've got a really strong signal to communicate, but you've got quite a strong signal here that they're not going to read you. So I would say, forget writing for a second, and then call them, or go to their desk. These are the sorts of people you basically, you know, you may need to basically, you know, physically hang around them, get that space and say, look, you're after this. I know you've got no time. Listen to this. Here's my one minute pitch. I can write you a note. No point in writing reams and reams and reams uh, on this because you won't get read. So to, um, to repeat kind of my main point, do this before you start writing it, it's going to save you a tremendous amount of time. Now, before we go into some questions, 
just want to, you know, just talking about time here. What does let's, let's let's think about this. What does a good writer? How does a good writer benefit? The first thing is time. If you've got good writing skills and you plan your work and you do something like a reader response model, you will save tons and tons of time. You'll save your time because you'll write quicker and more focused, but you'll save your readers' time. Remember, your email might go out to 50 people, might go out to a million people. If it's bad, if it's not particularly well written, you're wasting 100 people, a million people's time. And that's, um, you know, that is a big thing to avoid. Other advantages of being a good writer. Well, good writers actually stand out at work um, because, let's be honest, so few of us are good writers. So if you are interested in this, your investment in time, in skills, in practice always, always pays off. I've just had a question, I've just had a question come through, something perhaps a slightly cheeky question. I'm not going to tell you who it's from. It's, it's, it's someone that I've taught before, and I always said that um, uh, as a good writer, you'll be happier at work because basically people really like you. And she's saying, do you still stand by that? I say, even more so, even more so. Because, you know, we all know there are certain people that write to us. And I'm talking really about work rather than friends where you just think, ah, oh, it's great, I'm gonna understand this, it's gonna it's gonna, you know, be a worthwhile worthwhile return on my time. Okay, just another interesting question that's come in. Yeah, okay, I, I've I've used the word uh, when we talk about the panel example, I use the word manipulate rather than influence. What's the difference? Okay. For me this is a big thing. People influence they're great. They get us to do what we want to do. People that manipulate us get us to do what we don't want to do deep in our soul. Now, manipulation can be really serious. It can be sort of semi-genteel, but it always comes with a slightly risky downside. I think all of us can be manipulated by certain people once. Afterwards, you know, if we're manipulated, the ne once the next time we meet them, even if what they're saying to us is good and to our benefit, we're much more skeptical. So, influence positive, manipulation seriously, seriously negative. Okay, I think I'm just going to drink water. A little personal detail for you, and let's get to point number three. This is a huge one for me. This is the idea of flow. Now, flow comes, we achieve flow in any form of life. When we're doing a task that we love, that we're getting feedback on, that it stretches us a bit but doesn't destroy us. Now, many of the, the ideas of flow that psychologists uh, first studied were in sport. So certain tennis players, um, or if you're into martial arts, certain martial artists always feel on top of their game at certain stages. They don't have to, everything they do is natural. Just feels absolutely perfect. Those of you who do yoga, for example, you can have certain yoga classes where you start and then 90 minutes later you're over and it's, time's just gone. You're, or, you know, you're good at your game, as people say, or you're on your game. Psychologists then took the sporting ideas and move them into the workplace. And let's, let's see how this affects, how this impacts on writing. So, this is, again, this is something to think about before you start writing, or, and this is very important, as you're in the writing process, especially if you feel a bit nervy when you're writing. So on this axis here, we've got the degree of challenge of a, product, of a project. This is easy, this is really, really difficult. And here we have your perception of your own writing ability going from low to high. Let's take a look at Miriam. Now Miriam feels that she has low writing ability and she's been given a challenge that is very difficult. So how is she going to feel? She's going to feel out of her depth, she's going to feel stressed, she's going to feel lost, she's going to feel like she wants to do something different. Uh, she'll kind of spend a lot of time not getting anywhere. And I think many of us who've written for a living 
have experienced the sense that oh, this is too much, this is a step too far. I don't have the skills, I don't understand the brief, deadlines impossible, stress, stress, stress. Now, what are the practical steps you can take to minimize this feeling? Well, before I give you those, I just want to say congratulations on checking in with yourself. If you're in the Merriam zone, well done you for recognizing that, because the first step is recognizing, ah, I don't feel good about this because it's too difficult. What can you do? Ask for help. Ask for clarification from whoever's commissioned the project from you and think about chunking the project down. Don't think 500 page report, think 12 chapters. Don't think 12 chapters, think each chapter has four modules. Each module has three paragraphs. Think about it now. Make tiny bits of it and you've got paragraphs to write rather than 500 pages. Our second person is going to be Nadine. Now, Nadine has a high amount of ability. The challenge is very low. Now, now again, maybe not with writing, but lots of other parts of work, we sometimes feel this, and this, this we just feel rubbish. We're bored, we're irritated. This is a repetitive task we've done too frequently before. What happens here, we start to, we do tasks, we, we're slapdash, we do things too quickly, we start polishing our resume, looking for another job. Now, what can the dean do? Well, she can offer, in an ideal world, you know, to coach anyone that's here. So she can move from being a good writer to being a, a, a writing coach. Sometimes, that's a big generalization, people who are really good at writing, they don't always make fantastic coaches and trainers, but they have time, if, they, if their job's too easy, they've got time to learn and to practice this. Nadine could also ask for more complex work. Let's see what happens when you're in flow. Olivia. Now, Olivia's got this just right, or actually maybe she could just be up here a little bit more, maybe down here, but in this sort of zone, you see this channel, the white channel, this is the flow channel. So if you had a young writer, an inexperienced, Job is there just enough to keep them going. You've got a real experienced writer, just enough to stretch them without burning them out. Now, what happens over time? If you stay in flow, you move from here, up to here, up to here. <coughs> and you're always feeling that every task gets you, pushes you forward as an individual without destroying you. Now, if you're managing people, any of these three people, and you want to help them get into flow, the key is feedback. It's like, remember the tennis example. If you've got a coach saying to someone, to a tennis player, immediately, great shot, bad shot, telling them why it was good, telling them why it was bad, changes to make, immediate feedback puts people into flow. Don't wait to write a lengthy report on someone. Just say, that was great, you know, or no, 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 that's wrong, you want to change that. The speed of feedback is really, really crucial, really crucial to get people into flow. Okay, there are our two, or there are our three people. Go for number three. Important things I said with one, check in, know where you are, especially during the process of writing. You may start, interestingly enough, you watch out for this, you may start here, Okay, perhaps slightly overconfidently, and as the pro as the task rolls on, you might end up here. The obverse is true as well. You might think, "Oh, this is impossible," and then you go, "Oh, it's okay." Oh, look at me, plain sailing. So be aware that your perception on this graph changes. Okay, what else can you do to think about your ideal conditions? Well, let me talk about me for a, 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 a second. Here are the things that, for me, and everyone is really personal in this, make for good writing. I like long stretches of writing. I like to work for an hour and a half, have a break, write for another like one and a half hours. For me, the earlier I start, the better. If I'm working at home on a project, three or four hours, I can do two days' work in the office. Okay? I need to have my space. I need a desk that's completely clear of other people's class and of my clutter as well. And to be honest, I'm antisocial. I don't want anybody near me. I don't get any energy from other people. 
I don't take calls, I switch off Twitter and all that sort of stuff. I love music. My music is really, really has to be specific. It can't be stuff I don't know. It's got to be familiar music. Music gives me a rhythm, gets me going. After a while, I don't notice it. But I do notice silence. What's bad for me? Grabbing bits of time, bursts of time for writing. Ten minutes here, ten minutes there. Rubbish for me. Writing in the afternoon. Pointless. I can't work in situations where there's clutter because all I'm thinking about is get this rubbish off my desk. Yeah, I need a computer, a notepad, and a pen. And weirdly, I'm one of those people that uses a, a, a notepad and a computer all the time. Yeah, some people just do one or the other. A, a bit of paper, really old school, does help me. I can't stand absolute silence. It freaks me out. But I hate lots of noise. I know lots of people who actually get their energy from people being noisy around them. And I, I think the distinction is a monk against the rock star. The monk is early morning silence, clear deaths. The rock star is lots of noise, people around him or her. Okay, People get, especially extrovert people, get a lot of energy from the interruptions. They like short bursts, 10, 15 minutes, and they do more than 20 minutes of writing and they get bored. They want to talk to someone for two minutes. Yeah? Just the important thing is just know who you are. Yeah? Who, you know, what situation is good for them, for you, and then look for them. If you're in a place that doesn't let you, you know, that is noisy, for example, doesn't let you work at home, Find a disused office. Go to a library. Yeah? Again, if you're in management, do you have staff who, who veer towards the introvert who may prefer this type of work, working environment? Do you have the trust in them to say, tomorrow, work at home? Yeah? That, I remember that one of the first things. I worked for um, one of my first jobs was I qualified as a chartered accountant, which is not something you would traditionally think was, you know, had a lot of writing skills, but because I had an English degree, they often got me to write reports at PwC, and they had a real breakthrough where my manager said, look, why don't you take these printouts home, what you've written so far, stretch, you know, throw them on the floor, stretch them around, edit them like that, and suddenly a week's work, for me, I was really not looking forward to, became a very quite enjoyable day. So try and be, well, be aware of your conditions and try and improve them. Okay, a little graph there, let's spend 30 seconds, just concentrate on the good. So I've, I've, I've put categories there, time, space and noise. When is the best time of day for you to write? Just think about it. Also think about editing. Sometimes I like to edit in the evening. Something about the evening makes me more judgmental and more critical. In the morning I'm all kind of hallow birds, hallow trees, and it's a good time to start. In the evening I'm much tighter on myself space. Where is it that you like to work? What's your ideal writing space? Just write it down. The noise. What do you like around you? Absolute silence, tons of noise, music. Is there something that acts as a cognitive signal that you, you, there's a condition that you, you, there's a space, there's a place that whenever you go there you feel like writing? Identify that. Okay? Give another five seconds, because I'm generous with time. Have another ten seconds. Okay. Great. Fourth point. Oh, now we're going to emotions. Oh, feedback. Um, why don't we like giving feedback? Let's turn this around a bit. Yeah. Why don't we like helping people? You know, for example, feedback to someone could be, if they're a friend, you say, like, by the way, you've got pasta sauce on your toy. Okay? Your friend would be really grateful if you said that to your friend just before he goes into an interview. So that's form of feedback, isn't it? <laughs> You're saying something really, really positive. Go, oh, thanks, mate. Oh, I'm glad I knew that. When it gets to writing, though, we don't do that. Why don't we like it? The first thing is type. We know that to read someone's work, to write up some points, to explain things to that understand, that's a big time commitment. Everyone, let's face it, everyone is pushed for time at work. So we've got, if, you know, if we're giving someone that time and it's not our primary job, we know something in return, which I'll explain later. 
we don't like to upset our friends. We're pointing out things that we feel like, let's, let's, let's get through this, let's be honest about this, that we think are wrong. We may, however we say express it, oh, this could be improved, or this has got great potential, we're saying, no, it's not right to go out there. And we fear, <coughs> excuse me, we fear upsetting them. But remember my pasta Thai example, better to tell them than someone else to tell them. You know, once they've printed uh, a thousand, uh, you know, uh, copies. I'll give you a slightly risky example. A friend of mine wrote an email that finished with the line, a pen is mightier than a sword, and he missed a space in that last line. I'm not going to tell you what it is, you can probably work it out. If he'd had that checked, it would have been great for his career. What we don't like is upsetting the work hierarchy as well. We don't like giving feedback upwards. Okay, so we have bosses. I remember again thinking about one of the, one of the places where I worked. Bear in mind now, I had a you know I had a lot of business experience. I had a qualification as an accountant. I had a master's degree in English from Cambridge, and some old accountant was saying, "No, I don't like while use whilst." Okay, there's no point in me going out to battle to prove him wrong, or you know, or just say I think. And this is better, and he could sack me the next day. You know, choose your examples. When you give feedback up, choose your examples. And sometimes it can be quite a positive thing to say. Look, there's just one thing you could change. And someone, if you've got a reasonable person above you, a long way above you, who's, you know, most people who are successful have got there because they've listened to people and accepted help. And as long as you're not too finickety or giving too many things, that person, she should say, Oh, good point. I really like what you've given me there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal it. But I'm gonna put it in. Okay. Here's another thing. We often feel if we're looking at someone's more detailed work, we lack the knowledge to help them. It doesn't matter. What they're after is not your knowledge of the content. Is of their right. It's your perception of their writing skills. Now. Four categories of feedback that you get. You need to be able to categorize these before you respond. One of the real, I'll give you the most dangerous two types of feedback. The entirely complimentary. If someone, if you send like a four page document to someone and they say, I don't, don't change a thing. They're basically saying one of two things. The positive one is basically, I love you and I'm in awe of you and you're a great writer. That's always wrong, no matter how great you are, I don't know, I, I suspect you're all fantastic, but it's never true about writing can always be improved. The other thing here that's really dangerous, it actually means, don't change a thing, sometimes I haven't read your stuff and I can't, I can't admit that to you, so I think I'm going to tell you it's fine, really watch out for that. Destructive, I remember when I worked in an investment bank, wrote an equity analysis report, 20 pages, the guy said, change all of it, it's all rubbish. And basically what he's saying is, you're an idiot, he's saying this to me. And also, the way I sort of dealt with that, was just they so, his opinions were so strong about such minor things, I just thought there's like kind of basically something wrong with him. Uh, and that was, <laughs> that was kind of proven later in a story I can't tell you now. But often people are like that, yeah, you've caught them, it's their bad day or it's their bad time in life. Something, someone's completely destructive. It says a lot more about them than it does about you. Where you need to concentrate is on two types of feedback that will make you a better writer. Or strictly speaking, suggestive feedback makes your writing better this time. Advisory often makes you a better writer in the long term. So let's do suggestive. So they could say, if you hit, read this or hear this in feedback, all right, next time change this. What it's, what it's saying is that this is good enough. It's fine to go out. It's not your finest hour. Next time it can be better. So suggestive, it's good, you know, saying good enough. Advisory is actually saying you've got to change this before it can go out, and it's telling you how to change it. So something here would be, you're using the passive tense a lot, which people don't like in business, people don't like reading, make it better by changing from passive to active. Both of these, you find, they, they make your current project better, they make you long term, especially the advisory, better as well. And try and separate that, that feeling, I've got to get a report out now, you know, by 5 p.m., 
Oh, we've missed that actually, in the UK by 6 p.m. tonight. And I also want to become a better writer in the medium and long term. Two types of feedback you need to get. Uh, let me talk about me, okay? I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've been writing, oh God, I've been writing forever, you know, as a child, uh, as a student and in business, you know, maybe years and years of business writing. I always ask for feedback. I know feedback always makes my writing better. I don't like getting it. I always get an emotional response. And it sometimes it just lasts for two seconds, and sometimes it's just, oh, I've got to make changes. But often it's, oh, I'm not good enough. Ah. And you just, you've, got to, you've got to get through that. Acknowledge that. No one likes getting feedback, because as a minimum, it means more work. But just acknowledge that. And like, don't go into the feedback straight away. Do something else. Come back to it, and then I always do this. Whoever's given me feedback, before I even look at it, I call them. I email them and I say thank you and in my mind I make a point of saying thanks this is really good and then I jump in and what I see straight away is easy silly things I've missed that spell check doesn't get or gets wrong or grammar on you know on Microsoft Word gets wrong and I, I get really hacked off with myself but you get lots of easy wins here small changes like spelling making sentences clearer, tidying up your punctuation, all great for the quality of your work, make loads of improvements. Then you get into the bigger things. Now what happens here, the more feedback you get, the more you can say with confidence, actually I like a lot of their feedback, but they're not right on this. If you find yourself saying, I don't like any of their feedback, you're overconfident, yeah? and you're not smart enough to know that people are really putting effort into this. So watch out for that. But you do, you just have a lot of feedback. You say, that's right, but I'm okay with mine. And then I do the big changes. The big changes, you need a new chapter, this module doesn't work, do some more research. These are serious amounts of work. And it's work, you know, these are not little things. This is like days and days, an afternoon, have a break, get a cup of tea, carry on. I always, at this stage, start to feel much better about my work and about myself. Then I finish. And that's great. It's better now. The feedback, even if it's just an afternoon after you've done a month of writing, will always make your quality jump. The person that gave me the feedback, I give them a call. I say thanks a lot. And then I do something else and it's job done. Remember, job done isn't here before the feedback. First drafts of first drafts is not the same as writing. So I'm going to really stress to you, get feedback. Okay, the last thing, this is the secret tip number five, it's charity collectors. Now, charity collectors, these are the guys uh, collecting with their tins outside tube stations, outside the bus stop and wherever. They, have, they work from scripts, and the scripts are very, very tight. And if you, you know, if you follow them, you look at them, listen in, uh, you, can, you can see how the script works. Now, the script follows the SCQA approach, situation, complication, question, and answer. So they'll say it's like this, donkey is my complication. It's always, it's always, the complication has to be negative. It's going to get worse because the hay harvest has failed. Question, what can you do about it? What can we do about it? What can be done? The answer is going to be change your feelings. Remember how this one links up? Your thoughts or your actions. Oh, poor donkeys. I can do something about that. What's the action? I sign up for a £10 a month direct debit. So that you know, the average direct debit collected by one of these charity collectors last five years and um, it's £10 a month. So on average, if they get one of these, it's £600 which uh, as much as uh, £20 of that will go to the charity. That's a joke, by the way. But they will take, you know, probably 14 months of that, the company that organises. Now, why am I doing this? Right, really, It's a really great example of type writing, but SCQA is how you should do an introduction to anything that you're working on that's more than a page long. Get the situation. It's getting worse. What can be done? Here are the answers. This is how you write introductions. Okay, I'm going to try open to questions in a couple of minutes, in a minute. 
I'll just tell you about the course and about the book. Now, the course is, is obviously one on business writing. There's a second one, communication, influence, and uh, teamwork, which is actually going to be split into three separate courses by Excel with Business. All available, you know, I've only skimmed the surface of the surface in this presentation, especially on business writing, there's so much more, so so many more examples. Look now, now that now you started to get interested in this, look, wherever you are, look for good examples, look for examples of SCQ. Every time you read a newspaper article, especially one on finance that's not on a page, it should begin SCQA. You'll see it again and again. My book, Smack, is available on Amazon and it's lots of different techniques that will help you in different examples. And now I'm going to ask Aman to tell me if you have any questions. Let me see. Andreas, I have a I have a question from somebody here who asks, um, how long does it take to, to get good at business writing? Well, that's a very good question, actually. How long does it take? Uh, I'm tempted to say forever because you're always learning new stuff and there are always good new examples to pick up. But actually, I don't think it takes very long. I go back to this point that we, we've all, all of us have done um, uh, kind of presentation skills training and we're all used to getting feedback. You know, don't talk with your arms crossed, across, uh, folded across your chair, speak up, use the computer. We're all happy with that. Writing is different because all of us have got a bad memory of writing from school where a teacher said, well, I don't understand this, or you did an essay and it was rubbish because you stayed up all night. Or even something, you know, for me, I remember some teachers always say I terrible handwriting. It always upset me. You know, so we all carry these memories from school. None of us did PowerPoint at school, I hope, you know. But writing, you have to go through that emotional side. And I think I think you can improve massively in a couple of weeks just by just by being aware of what you're doing. Changing, putting the reader up front is such a big part of this. And that long, waffly answer is to say it could be two weeks, it could be forever. Thank you for that, Andreas. We have another question here from Dusty, Dustin Hickey, who asks, uh, what do you do when you are dealing with writer's block? So was that dealing with writer's block? That's right. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, what you have to tell yourself, and we cover this a lot on the course and in the book, writer's block doesn't exist. We think of it like, um, you know when people say, oh, they're, they're, they're procrastinating, and they make it sound like it's kind of a disease that they've caught. No, it's just a way of saying, I ah, don't feel like doing it now. Writer's block, I think, is exactly the same. We do all have moments where we get tense with our writing, we get fed up, and we just like have our head in our hands and we say we're blocked. And it's, you know what? The more we say that to each ourselves, the more it becomes our reality. So steps that I have, the simplest one is stop. If you're saying to yourself, I'm blocked, then you will become blocked. What you need to do is get out. If you're not pressed with time, do another task. If you have to keep going, paradoxically, stop. Stop for 20 minutes and get away from the desk and walk outside. Something that always, always happens with me, whether I'm writing for business, whether I'm writing a novel, whether I'm a huge report, if I get stuck, I just go out for a walk. And I don't force myself to think of a problem. I put some music on. The solution always comes. Now you can do this at work by popping out for coffee and not drinking the coffee, or popping out at lunch break and just walking around the park. This will always, this is kind of a complete guarantee that it will work. And I want to kind of be a bit more generous than perhaps I was before and say, writer's block does exist. And it so often happens when we're tired. Now, if you're tired while you're writing, maybe you're kind of irritable while you're writing, or you're really shattered. That's going to show in your writing. Again, I would say, stop. Don't work late at night on your writing unless you really, really have to because you'll make more mistakes, your quality will be lower, and it will show to the reader. Okay? I, I, it's half past now. I'm, I'm aware that we've gone over... Well, I'm glad so many of you stuck around. 
uh, we've gone over the allotted time. I, I, I'm happy to stay. Is, is there one more question? No? Yes, uh, we, we do have one more question. We'll, we'll make this the last one, and it's from okay. Daryl Johnson, who wants to know, how often do you change content objective if you know there are multiple recipients of the same document? For example, yeah. simultaneous email sent to finance, sales, and compliance and legal departments. Oh, okay. I, 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 caught, I just missed the first sentence there, man. It's about uh, the same documents to different people. Yes, that's right. Okay, that's a really good point. Go back to the reader response. Think about what you need. It's one thing I cover in the book and and in the um, quite a lot on the course as well. Good writing uh, takes a has a pyramid function, has a pyramid form. So you get your main message across right at the top, subsidiary messages, and you go down. And you can structure your work in such a way. That say you have say, say it was the same report and it was going to legal, it was going to compliance, and it was going to accounting. Okay, four pages on. Let's say it's about buying a new uh, no. Let's say it's about intellectual uh, spend on intellectual property. Now all of that information has to be there if you're making a recommendation. If you structure your report properly, though, remember SCQA. So the SCQA will be something like, I've been asked to investigate buying this brand, we need this brand, or the, the complication is, for example, the brand is becoming more expensive, we need to make a decision today, what do we need to do, that's your cue, your recommendation buying this brand. So that goes to everyone on your list. Now you have all your reasons why, let's say the, the three major reasons fit in with accounting, compliance and legal. If you do your report, if you structure your report properly, the legal guy can see that you've got accounting covered, can see that you've got compliance covered, can just focus on exactly what he or she wants to read. And it's the pyramid structure that allows you to do that. It's a very clever thing because it means all of your work is, comes out, which is great, so you can show quantity but you're also giving reader quality because he or she can follow exactly what she needs. Again, look at the look at the course, um, you know, where, where we discussed the pyramid, and it will show you exactly what to do. And you'll see, and again, you'll start to see these the, this this sort of hidden structure in really good quality reports. Because what it feels like, though, is like, that you've done work that is tailored. That is tailored for many people. So people think, oh my God, it's, it, it, he's right, he's written this for me when you haven't. And that's hugely beneficial in terms of your time and your status. Okay, so I think that's pretty, pretty much all I'm going to say now. So I wish you, uh, wherever you are, the rest of your day or the rest of your night, I hope it's a great one. And, you know, I think we'll do. Uh, another couple of webinars once the once the holidays are over. Okay, speak to you soon, everyone. Take care. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thank you for that, Andreas. I uh, I, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed that. We've had lots of comments come through. People thanking uh, Andreas uh, for, for a great webinar. Uh, once again, I apologise for the the start, the late start, and the uh, technical difficulties that we had. And uh, I hope you'll join us again for the next webinar.